Professor William Bonfield, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very grateful to interview you as part of our alumni series and we're looking forward to finding out more about your imperial journey and beyond. You completed both your BSc and your PhD at um, Imperial College London. Uh, what was it like back then and are there any particularly special memories that you would like to share? Well, it was the dark ages, of course. It was a long time ago. Uh, we were a small class, 25, when I joined, and it was metallurgy, so it wasn't material science. Great course, very practically orientated, and, for example, in the long vax, we always had to have work experience. First year, I went to the Steel Company of Wales in Port Talbot. Second year, I went to what was uh, Northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, to work on a copper mine. So, fantastic course for the undergraduate. Uh, but for the PhD, the great thing about Imperial was they were embracing semiconductors, and I had a final year project on indium antimonide, and then did a PhD on germanium single crystals. So, really cutting edge material science in a metallurgy department. What motivated you to become a researcher, and were you always interested in the field of biomaterials? Well, I started out doing a PhD, which meant I was interested in research, but not just in research. And in fact, after my PhD, I went to work in American industry, where as well as doing research on inertial navigation systems, I actually had a management role too. And that, I think, equipped me well to come back to the UK as a British academic. So you are internationally recognised for various pioneering research contributions in the field of biomaterials in medical devices. Are there any research insights that you can share? Okay, can I give you some examples? I'll give you three examples. First of all, you need a model, and the model was bone. We wanted to do something for bone, and I had the advantage that I'd worked on bone mechanics for a long time and knew a lot about bone. Bone is basically hydroxyapatite, bone mineral, in a collagen matrix. It's a composite, a natural composite. So the first question I asked was, can we replicate and make a composite synthetically? We could make hydroxyapatite in the lab. We couldn't make collagen in the lab. So we used polyethylene instead, but we made a composite. And we found by altering the amount of hydroxyapatite, we could actually make it bioactive and at the same time, just stronger than natural bone. So it was a perfect material to use. The test was, though, could we use it in a clinical application? And the one that we got involved in was suborbital blowout fracture. What is that? It's breaking the bone underneath the, the eye. It happened with jet fighter pilots ejecting. It happened with people playing squash. And there wasn't a decent remedy, but we found that our material could be carved to shape, put in place, and without any fixation would bond to the surrounding bone. Perfect outcome. So that was a small beginning. The second one was to say, OK, that took quite a long time to integrate into bone. Can we make it integrate faster? And particularly then, can we impact bone grafting, which is universally used to repair the skeleton. And we found that by tweaking the chemistry, doing lots of experiments, that we were able to make the time for bonding to bone decrease from about a month to within seven days, which was remarkable. That resulted in scaling up to a company. The company marketed uh, our bone graft called ActiveFuse worldwide particularly the first application was spinal fusion, great success, and now it's used universally throughout the world as a synthetic bone graft with remarkable properties. And the final one then is the complete turn of the circle to come back to the idea that bone is a composite, it's not just hydroxyapatite. And this time we did in fact use hydroxyapatite, collagen, and glycosamine and glycan to build a material for cartilage replacement. Cartilage is the ultimate challenge because it doesn't repair easily. But by making this uh, composite structure, we found that particularly for young people, you could repair lesions in cartilage. So again, it's about having a model, following the model, and then taking it all the way to the clinic. 
Research seems like a long, challenging and demanding career. For me, working in biomaterials, the answer is patient satisfaction. That you can actually see things you've done in the lab ending up in the clinic and benefiting patients. And from the examples I gave you before, let me just follow one through. And that is our first composite of hydroxyapatite polyethylene which was not just used for suborbital blowout fracture, but then became the material of choice for replacing the ossicles in the middle ear. These are patients who have conductive hearing loss. And what was needed was an implant that would go in and restore that connection between the inner ear and um, the sensory mechanism, which it did. And what is remarkable then is about 60,000 patients a year directly benefited, and the longevity of the implant, first introduced in 1985, and still the most used middle ear implant in 2022, now marketed by Olympus in Japan. Are there any breakthroughs in current biomaterials research that excite you? Well, the, the whole field is wide open now, and again, the recent COVID experience has demonstrated the importance of understanding cellular reaction. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to continue to develop biomaterials that will actually um, contribute to the health and well-being of the population at large. Do you know what the 24 or so other students who you were with at Imperial ended up doing? Uh, yes, because we kept in touch. We went up in 55, graduated in 58, so we were called the 55ers. And probably starting about 25 years later, we started having an annual reunion with wives to discuss where we'd all gone. The interesting thing, they all ended up in metallurgy or material science activities. A lot of them went abroad because of our connection in our undergraduates for going to work in Rhodesia, Canada, places abroad. Um, but we no, we kept in touch and it was, um, I think, a tribute to the fellowship that we enjoyed during our undergraduate time that uh, that continued. The other group I kept touch with was my uh, PhD group under Ron Bell who again went on and did all sorts of interesting things in, in material science. What advice would you give current students at Imperial studying material science and engineering? Well, first of all, I'd reassure them. They've made a great choice because of all the things you could study, material science underpins everything that's going to take place in the future. Green, sustainable, digital health, all of these topics are underpinned by material science. So you've chosen well. Secondly, you've chosen a great place. I think whatever success I've had comes back to the experience I had at Imperial College, first for my first degree, which was fantastic, but then my PhD. And again, just to give you facts, still in the lab at Imperial in my final year, my third year PhD, I received three job offers to go to the United States, one of which I took to work for Honeywell. But that, again, was not just me. That was the power of the institution, which was seen as the MIT of the UK. So you've chosen well. The other advice I would give is don't be trapped by whatever your project is. My project was on germanium. Great start, great project. I got papers out of it. I never looked at germanium again and eventually moved into biomaterials. So the world's your oyster, but a great start, and I'm, I'm sure all the students at Imperial will do very well.